Welcome to Church Hurts and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery thrown in. If you've ever had questions about the church, maybe a bit jaded in your attitude toward religion, well, you've come to the right place. Our host, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, planted three churches, taught at a prestigious university, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question why. The host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bass. I cared for my name, Clive Staples. The world came to know me as C.S. Lewis. Perhaps you read my books. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is the most famous, but there's one story that's not so well known. It's my story. And who better to tell it than me? Uh, John Bash with Church Hurts and. Hello. And we have Max McLean on the red carpet of opening day. Max. I would say C.S. Lewis is the elephant in the room to the modern day skeptic. Yeah. What do you say? I agree. I agree. Because, you know, he's our bridge from this post-modern, post-truth, post-Christian world that uh, we're just embedded in. It's like water to this world. And he, and he gives us a, he gives us a, a bridge to the world of, of uh, joy, the world of here we have no continuing city, the world of we're, we are created a little lower than the angels, a world of God has set eternity in our hearts. And that's the world that Lewis just draws a, a marvelous picture of. Most people know C.S. Lewis because of the wonderful fantasy. How do you connect a man so committed to reality? How do you get him doing so well with fantasy? Is there a connection? No, oh, it's it, because he, he recognized that the worlds are connected. That, uh, you know, that the whole religious impulse is that there's more to there's more to reality than we know. This is a shadow land that, r that real life hasn't yet come. And that sometimes we get these glimpses of it, these little threads. So and of course, what our world is trying to say, this is only, you know, only believe what you can empirically prove, empirically see. And that's a that's a world that leads to that's dry bones. Right. It's so good. Tell me this. What was it like having uh, people trying to dress you like C.S. Lewis? And, I loved it. And, and they're, they're made to do nice outfits, and they have to be messy to yeah, be Lewis, yeah, right? Yeah, but I loved it. I absolutely adored it. I mean, you know, I, I, it was amazing. The, the makeup artist who did Death of Stalin, uh, I thought they, she transformed me. You know, I, I, people were confused, <laughs> and I was grateful for, I was grateful for that. They put any cigarette holes in the jackets? Uh, you know, actually, we weren't even allowed to smoke in the kilns because of the strict protocols that they have there. So we just had to wing it. Yeah. Thank you so much for your work on this film. Thank you. It's a joy. I'm, I'm excited. Thank you. I have the privilege of having a crazy man who is also a producer, and he's from across the pond, uh, Norman Stone. I, I think that this movie is the elephant in the room for the modern day thinker. What do you think? I, I actually agree. I don't know what you mean, but I agree. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I think I was saying to somebody back there when Lewis did his talks that eventually became mere Christianity, he was going into the blitz, into the bombs to talk at the BBC, to talk to the nation about God because they were seeing death every moment. Mrs. McAfee down the road had just got hit by a bomb that children out in the army had been killed. It was, death was in the face all the time. And Lewis talked in such a way that even in the pubs of England and London, they would say, quiet, Mr. Lewis is on the radio, no one to speak, and they'd listen to him. Now when, since then, since the Blitz hit them in the face and wiped out so many people, have we had that amount of death in our society? Not until COVID. In Britain, it's been terrible. I know it has in America, too. Suddenly, you're looking at not the nice selling, just get more materialism, another car will be fine. Now you're looking at people that have been removed from your life and from their lives. And I think that makes a different perspective. You can 
say what you want, do what you want, but you know you're not going to last forever. This reminder's there. And I do believe that Lewis's words and character, which worked so well during the Blitz and, 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 and became that wonderful book, I think it's relevant now more than ever. And I find that with people. I've had people I gave a little viewing of here and there or showed them there. The most unusual people, secular people, are saying, whoa, Hang on a minute. This is this is really interesting. I really interested in what he said. I'm not sure I agree with that, but on the other hand, it, and if that can do that, I'm a happy man. Do you know what else I wanted to do? Uh -oh. I wanted to open the library doors. That guy has got so many books. What is it now? About a quarter of a billion out there, so still selling more every year. And he explains and talks and engages brilliantly with with people. Now, if this film or any of the other films I've done about Lewis. If that can swing open the library doors, I think we've done a good job, and hopefully it will. What I wonder is how much more satisfying is it, is it for you to be doing somebody that you agree with as a filmmaker <laughs> instead of just doing something else? Sure. You know, I mean, you really, you really believe the stuff that you're filming in this particular film, The Most Reluctant Convert. Yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian believer. and uh, But it's sometimes really good to make films about people you don't agree with. That's very sharp. But in this, when you see the point and you see his earning the right to be heard, he went through all that with Joy Davidman. I did the first Shadowlands. That's when I got to realize this. So um, when you realize he's been through all this and he doesn't lie about it, when he... He, when, I think one of the most impressive books he ever wrote was uh, Grief Observed. And Shadowlands is really Grief Observed, married with Surprised right. by Joy. But that, why do I think that's a strong book? I th think it's a strong book, the, the Grief Observed, because he talks straight. He doesn't, you don't hear the Hallelujah Chorus singing in the background. He has been hit hard and he writes about it hard. And that has helped more people in deep, deep mourning and distress and grief than anything. If you try to smile and put a, sorry, but a Jim Becker smile up and you, you say, this is Jesus, hello. I don't think you're being true to you or to God or to the power of grief. The Bible understands this. And Lewis did. And I believe I trust him when he talks about things because he's, I trusted him when, when he talked about death and loss and grief. I can trust him on the good stuff too. And I do. Do you think this film adequately conveys both his intellectual side in terms of the theoretical philosopher type and the really practical, personal, painful stuff that he writes about. Do you think it spans that gap pretty well? Yeah, I would worry about adequately. I don't think every, any film I've ever said has adequately done that. But um, yes, I think that if you trust the man you trust the words. And if you understand what it's meant to him, you listen better. It'll still take the Holy Spirit to move a man to, uh, or a woman to, to faith, but it's, it's absolutely, is he, can I rely on him? Can I, can I trust him? Would you buy a used car from him? Yes, if he's telling me the truth. And therefore, his great, I mean, bluff, people used to joke with him, his friends, and say, oh, you're a bluff common man talking to bluff common men in a bluff common man's language. But on the other hand, that's right, he was. And I find him so accessible. I know so many people. I don't want to make him a superhero. He wasn't. He was a human being. But he had a way of talking that was both true, self-depreciating, which helps, and forceful, thought through. He wasn't afraid of questions, and he tackled the answers. I'm sounding like a commercial. Lewis is also a human being, just remember that. But he was very, very powerful in what he said and wrote. How fun was it working with Max McLean? Could you say that again, please? <laughs> Max McLean and I have known each other for years. The one thing I remember, this is a scary thing, before he went on to the set for the first, after all this racing to the post to get it done, when he, went, when he went just before he stepped inside and to do the shot, he said, you know, of course, I've not been on camera before. I said, what? The cameraman neither went home. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but, you know, I've acted, of course, I knew that, but not been on camera. His performance is worthy of awards. I'm serious now. That is, he did a great job. And being on stage and being on camera are two separate things. And he mastered it. So I'd like to work with him again. I, I find him a great chum, but also a man who knows how to communicate 
even in silence, and not overdo it. I'm fed up of people overdoing acting. I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. But if you can communicate honestly, strongly, and like Alec Guinness, you watch him rather than the other people on the stage, which, which, which he was good at that. It's a skill and he uses it. Yeah, I loved working with him and will hopefully do it again. Now, for a very specific audience, uh, tell us your relationship with Martin Lloyd-Jones. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, he liked my father, who was a strict and particular Baptist preacher. He used to stay with us when I was a kid. Um, I then joined Westminster Chapel, but after he had gone uh, and retired from there, I was a good friend of Archie Kendall's when he came there. But um, yes, he was a guy who, again, told the truth no matter what it cost. Still does. I still listen to his sermons. He's a great, great man of God and was and is. And when I started my career, so-called, in uh, television and film, he would be the first person, after the little documentary of the BBC was over, the phone would ring, regular as clockwork, and he'd discuss the film with me, give me a criticism and encourage me, or say, mm, careful with that thing. I loved that. It was like having a fairy granddad that would just turn up after you've done stuff. So I was very fond of him and his family, uh, Fred Catherwood, Elizabeth's daughter, and so on. Um, but no, a very special man who has still got lots to say to me, at least, when I listen to his sermons on a Sunday afternoon. And there is hope in this day when everybody talks about conflicts. Here's a Presbyterian putting up with a Baptist in good humor. <laughs> I think you I think you know when truth is being told. You know that? And you I stumbled. Think, you stumbled on that one. I did because I'm not a Presbyterian or even a, I'm a strict and particular Baptist. And don't you forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Norman. Thank you. Well, that was worth a thought for sure, and brings us to the end of this edition of Church Hurts and. Next week, it's rumored we'll be walking on the edge of controversy, stirring the pot of denial, and finding movement of the divine. Our host, Dr. John Bash, is a shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of leaving the ministry prematurely. Come visit us at churchhurtsand.org. Tell us your story while you're there. Until then, remember, Church Hurts isn't the end of the story. Now go into the end. Enjoy God today, won't you?